right, I think this is a great time to get started. Hey, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Tope Falarin, and I'm the executive director at the Institute for Policy Studies. I'm so pleased to be in conversation with my colleague, Chuck Collins, who is the author of a fantastic new novel called Alter to an Erupting Sun. It is really a great book. I cannot wait for our conversation. Chuck is the director of the Program on Inequality and the Common Good here at IPS. Uh, where he also co-edits in, co uh, inequality.org. He's also co-founder of divestinvest.org, a global movement to divest from fossil fuels and invest in climate solutions. And he's a trustee of the Post Carbon Institute and resilience.org. Um, Chuck, I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, as I was telling you just a few minutes ago, this is a fantastic book. I admire you for doing this because I know how busy you are and you're such a prolific writer somehow managed to get all this done. So I just wanted to start by saying congratulations on this book. Thank you. And and uh, it's great to be able to talk to somebody who I think of as a real novelist and, <laughs> and a real <laughs> you're... You know, scholarly writer and, and literary <laughs> writer. So you're our no, novelist you're... in chief here at, at <laughs> IPS and uh, hopefully we'll be cracking the narrative nut as we go through our work. You know? Oh, absolutely. And it's it's edifying for me as well. Um, to have colleagues who are, who are writing novels because we can commiserate and talk about, you know, how difficult it is to kind of sit down and, and try to come up with characters and plots and scenarios and make it all tie together. The thing that I'm most impressed with as I make my way through this book is the fact that you, you write like a novelist. And um, as you can probably imagine, I've been in conversation with a bunch of people who write nonfiction or they they kind of do policy work and they have other kinds of ambitions um and they try to sort of start doing the fiction thing and there's definitely it, it's a process to kind of figure out how to kind of switch over from the kind of policy orientation where there's a specific set of goals and a specific way of communicating to um the kind of novelistic form so i, I was hoping you could maybe start by talking a little bit about that journey and and how you did that yeah um you know i i it has been a couple year migration because um uh i've written other books about economics and actually i when i go back and look at the earlier things i wrote even 10 15 years ago they're really boring i mean there's no narrative element to it and I, I uh, but because of my the person I'm married to, uh, who's a real storyteller, like she has been part of like the moth and these kind of story, she kind of pulled me along like maybe 10 years ago, hey, you should start telling stories. So I would stand up and do live storytelling. Mm. And I real I really started to enjoy it. And then it started to affect my writing. Like, well, why wouldn't I bring uh, stories and characters and, little fl narrative flourishes into nonfiction writing. And of course, yeah. there's great nonfiction narrative writing. Absolutely. Uh, and those are the books that people like to read, actually. Mm -hmm. I, they're the ones I like to read. Um, so that, that I think, was part of it. Um, you know, I wrote a book called Born on Third Base that had a, wasn't a memoir, but it really tried to be more story. And even in um, this book, The Wealth Hoarders, which is about the hidden wealth industry, I start with three stories I call it my friendly narrative landing strip. You know, like if somebody starts in, you know, they crack the book, maybe <laughs> they'll stick with it. Yeah. I've had a lot of people, you know, after the stories though, and it starts talking about analysis and that, you know, you probably have a little bit of drop off. But so anyway, that that was part of the journey and just seeing that and then finally having a story that, oh, I think I have a story I want to tell. Yeah, that's great. I want to encourage all of you who are watching, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function to ask questions. We also encourage you to use the chat function if you have comments or just want to participate in the conversation along with us. Um, Chuck, I was, when did you start writing this book and what was the impetus for it? Um, in the winter of 2022 and, you know, uh, so a year and a half ago, I, I, I think around the end of the year in the winter time, I was reading some good fiction and I had had this story that was just kind of knocking on my inner door. It was a, mm -hmm. both a character, kind of a composite of a lot of people that I've met and imagined. And then this particular story as it relates to sort of climate change and climate disruption 
themes around violence and nonviolence. So um, I, uh, I think in February, a year ago, February started to write it and it really flowed. You know, I mean, uh, writing can be uh, a struggle, but in this case, I was just allowing myself, I wasn't attached to having it be published or anything. I was just like, I'm just going to write this story. I'm going to kind of get it out there, out of my system. And it kind of came out and I had a draft by uh, this time last year. Wow. And, uh, and then we have a a terrific uh, local publishing house in Vermont called the Green Rider Press. So again, I thought, well, I could get an agent and that's going to be two years, you know. Yeah. I just sent it over there and they're like, this is interesting. This is great. Well, we'll, we'll do it. And, uh, and I was all through the whole process, I've been like a guy in a hurry, you know, like yeah. partly because of the themes around climate and climate resilience. So I even, uh, a, a really good editor read it at one point for the press and said, you know, if you, you should slow this down and take, take a year. And I was like, no, I, I, first of all, I have my day job at the Institute for Policy Studies. I can't yeah. spend a lot of time on this. And, uh, you know, I got to get back in my lane over there where I, where I really belong, but I really want to do this. So, um, so it, it wasn't a, a multi-year process as it, as it probably should have been. Uh, but, uh, given the topic and who I am, it, it, it is what it is. So, yeah, no, I think it lands beautifully. And I, and I, again, really admire your, your narrative skill, um, and the way you deployed in this book, and it prompts me to ask another question, which, and you kind of mentioned this before, you said that you were reading a lot of really good fiction and that kind of inspired you to kind of start taking your own journey. Could you speak a little bit more about the kinds of writers, the, the writers you were reading, the kinds of books you were reading that inspired you to start writing your own uh, novel? Yeah, I um, I read a lot of fiction. Uh, yeah. I read a lot of nonfiction, uh, but you know, Given my druthers, I read fiction, and uh, you know, a man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> and I listen. Oh, I listen. You know, to um, biography. So you know, when I'm, so that I take in. Now I'm one of those both read and audible, aud audio book readers. But um, you know, I think the. Uh, I always. I've never really like a science fiction reader. But mm -hmm. I've always liked like Octavia Butler, kind of the Afrofuturist, Ursula yeah. Le Guin, and sort of yeah. the utopian anarchists. And then um, Kim Stanley Robinson, who I have to say, I've tried to start some of his books and never got uh, you know that far. But I read The Ministry for the Future, which is a yeah. very interesting book about the next 40 years and kind of how humanity, you know, turns the corner toward yeah. you know, away from extinction. And that was, I thought, thought like a great use of, of vi vision and fiction. So I think I, I, I've, in, I've appreciated people who've tried to give us a, a, a possible vision, not a dark dystopian zombie vision, but a kind of what's humanly possible vision. Um, and then there's a local writer who I really like named Robin MacArthur, who's written a lot of very place-based books where I live and in mm. southern Vermont and she also does interesting things with time going back and forth in time and so I was like oh that's what I want to do too so anyway that so yeah along with you know other uh, I'm always looking for a good recommendation so yeah yeah it's so interesting to hear you talk about some of these writers um as it happens I'm speaking at a middle school next week and um you know it's it's interesting this is a middle school where apparently there are a bunch of kids who are either immigrants or first generation Americans and a lot of them have artistic ambitions and so they asked me to come in and talk with them because you know a lot of their parents are like the creative life doesn't make any sense whatsoever and apparently a number of these kids um, are really you know they're, they're interested in writing and painting and the rest of it and so I think part of my job is to, is to convince some of their parents that it can be a viable way of living and being in the world. And the principal asked me a couple of days ago, she said, you know, is there some book that you read in middle school that really impacted you and changed the course of your life? And it was a great question because I haven't thought in those terms in quite some time. And so I was going through um, my, my own personal library, you know, behind me and, and other places. And I remembered how impactful uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's Tales from Earthsea was. I mean, that book shattered me in a way 
Mm. And I think one of the reasons why I'm doing the work I'm doing, which is to say, you know, sort of doing policy work and also writing is because of her work. And there was another writer, a guy named Orson Scott Card, who wrote a, a series of books. Um, and it's funny because Orson Scott Card himself, I think, is conservative and has some views that are actually quite noxious, or at least that I find noxious. Um, but he wrote a series of books about a young sort of um, kind of child prodigy who is kind of conscripted into an army and there's an alien force that's attacking Earth. And um, and the second book in that series was about the, it was the first time I encountered um, ever the idea of, of genocide and the impact it can have on people because this character does something unintentionally horrific and and is forced to deal with the consequences of that. So I remember as a middle school um, kid sort of trying to grapple with a lot of the themes that were in that book. So I admire you for, and I, I admire you so much for kind of writing in the genre because I love science fiction so much and I and I watch a lot of sci-fi um, and derive a lot of comfort from sci-fi and also I'm scared you know as, as I engage in sci-fi as well because as you said there's a lot of dystopian stuff in that work so um, I I admire you for for doing that and I wonder as well as as as, as, a, as a novelist if you ever considered um, if you're thinking one about a next work, or if you ever kind of considered doing a, a more realist kind of contemporary story, or if you have always been drawn to writing in the sci-fi lane. Yeah, um, well, I should say, uh, I find fiction is often my gateway for learning about things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I can sit in my house and read, um, like I just finished a book called Stolen, which is about a, a young Sami woman in sort of northern Sweden. The, the, these are the sort of traditional indigenous reindeer people. Yeah, It's her story uh, about, you know, hunting and dealing with sort of the white Swedish culture. And I was like, where else am I going to get? I mean, I'm not, I've never been to Sweden. I may never get to Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> I may never meet a Sami person, but my whole world has been enlarged by that story. Same, same with like historical fiction. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the protagonist in my novel actually reads a novel that I read. I think it's called Saints and Villains about, it's a fictionalized version of the life of Diedrich Bonhoeffer, this German theologian who's part of a plot to kill Hitler. Through that fiction, that was my gateway into then, oh, I want to read that history. I want to understand that context. So um, even, you know, Altar for an Erupting Sun has both a sort of look forward, but it's also, yeah. there are elements of it, which are, you know, the movements that have formed my main characters. Uh, and some of those are movements that also form me, not all of them. Yeah. But um so I, I don't have any aspirations to write uh, more fiction yet. I mean, I'm, 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 I, I think I have, you know, I'm not going to retire anytime soon. I want to focus on sure. the struggles that you and I are involved with in the programmatic side. Yeah. But um, I just really celebrate good fiction as an invitation to learn and, and experience someone else's reality. Yeah. Could you provide like a capsule summary of your book uh, for folks who haven't had a chance to read it yet? Yeah, um, it's a, uh, uh, the story is really built around uh, a woman named Ray Kelleher. Uh, she's a Midwest, Ohio, really sort of Appalachia, grew up in Appalachia, working class. She's the first person to go to college. Um, the book actually starts and it's it's really not a, um, uh, uh, a deal. It's not going to. What, what's the phrase? It's not a. Uh, when, when you reveal the detail of a story, every a spoiler alert. It's not a spoiler oh, yeah. alert. Sure. It's not yeah. a spoiler alert to say yeah. that the book starts with Ray Kelleher now. You know, around seventy years old, she's facing a terminal illness, mm -hmm. and in her last act, she engages in a shocking act of sort of taking her own life and also taking the life of the CEO of an oil company who she blames for delaying responses to climate change. So it starts off with an action that is characterized by some 
in the media as eco-terrorism. Then it looks forward seven years to, all right, what impact did her action have? What was the blowback, the considerable blowback, the repression, the criminalization of dissent, the hammer that came down on, on climate change organizing? But it also looks at what's happened over the next seven years uh, that's more positive. How has how have different communities started to prepare and live differently in the face of climate disruption? And there's that's where there's a sort of little bit of visionary or utopian part. And then the main part of the part of the story is well, how did this person Ray, who really grew up surrounded by nonviolent social change movement elders, really shaped by movements to stop U.S. intervention in Central America and close down the School of Americas and stop evictions all through sort of traditional nonviolence. How did she come to, at the end of her life, take this dramatic action? So in that sense, it's a book of formation. It's what shapes somebody. So those are kind of the questions uh, that, that um, you know, what, you know, here, and I was, wanted to explore that the issues of violence and nonviolence and the kind of moment we're in and the frustration I hear people say all the time of we we're not going to be able to fix this our political system is incapable of sort of preventing the worst scenarios of the future at this point so anyway that that that's a bit of the summary it's uh how how are each of us shaped and how in this case is this person shaped I wanted to ask you a little bit, because I've been thinking a lot about how you write about violence and Ray's own journey with violence. And you know this moment, as you just said, um, where we have activists who are doing a number of things to um, talk about how pressing this issue is, to kind of uh, encourage people to, to pay attention to the environmental crisis. And, you know, there are activists, for example, who are um, throwing paint on, on works of art. There are some who are, for, you know, many years, uh, who have been engaged in acts of eco-terrorism as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about that tipping point. Um, you know, obviously, the movements that we work with, the traditions that we emerge from, emphasize the importance of nonviolence. But there have been any number, I mean, American history is studded with moments when people have just said enough, and they have gone in a more violent direction. Um, I wonder, one, how Ray arrives at that tipping point, and two, um, if you think our society is nearing that tipping point because of some of the pressing issues we're facing right now. Yeah, um, in, in a way, what I tried to do in Alter to an Erupting Sun is tell the story of how somebody gets to that point where they yeah. feel so frustrated and powerlessness, and powerless. And really, what 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 changed for her along the way, um, and also, um, as you say, there there are you know within the movements for nonviolent change, there's a fairly big spectrum of activity around direct action. Yeah. You, know, you have um, extinction rebellion, particularly in England, shutting down central London, shutting down the subway keeping people from going to their sporting events, things that are not popular, but they're saying out of their urgency, out of this moment, we feel a need to act. There's also a, tra a tradition of self-sacrifice. And you think of the, the Vietnamese monks during the Vietnam War who emulated themselves. Yeah, There are people in the US political tradition who have also emulated themselves. And I tell that the story, I weave those stories in because that's another expression of both the sense of powerlessness, but also the sense of wanting to make a powerful witness, all the way to you know people uh, destruction of property. Um, so you know, and Alex's sort of adopted daughter at the end of the book says, "Look, what Ray did was wrong, but what Ray would say to you is, what bold action are you called to?" in response to this assault on our one and only planet Earth. 
And uh, at the very end, there is literally a, a scene where a couple people are meeting with Ray in what the Quakers call a clearness, you know, kind mm. of a confidential having it out, including her husband, Reggie, and this adopted daughter, Alex. And they're, they're talking about tactical nonviolence and these different strategies. And Ray, Reggie's husband even says to her, this is a terrible idea. It's going to have all kinds of blowback. It's going to, and he's right. He's right. In the end, he's right. But uh, why don't you do a Norman Morrison? Norman Morrison actually, in protest of the Vietnam War, self-emulated in front of the Pentagon outside Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense's office. Powerful witness, unthinkable for many people. Yeah. Um, but it had an impact. Um, so that that I wanted to kind of in fiction lift up, dramatize, and even give character to some of these historic people uh, who struggled with what what's the what action should I take in in response to this moment? Yeah. Do you think, I mean, so in terms of where we are as a society now, and again, some of the pressing challenges we're facing, uh, do you think we're at a point where we need some of that? And, and how should that look? I, I know it's a big question, but I just wanted you to muse for a moment on that. Yeah, I think I think we're really close to a moment yeah. where uh, we, we have to dramatically get more militant and more uh, uh, powerful. And, and I think, and, I try to show this through Ray's consciousness because, you know, I think like a lot of people, she starts off thinking, well, I, I'm responsible for climate change. I live in the global North. I'm up, you know, I live a relatively privileged life. You know, I shoot, I drove to the corner store instead of walking, you know, I'm part of, I'm part of the problem. And also she spends a lot of time in Central America that forms her. And so she understands the global inequity and the reality that those of us in the global North are burning way more carbon and methane than many people in other parts of the world. So we have a disproportionate responsibility. And she sort of still believes that, but she comes to realize that the fossil fuel industry uh, and what she would say is a few dozen corporations and their financial enabler. She calls them the carbon barons or the oil garks. Oil garks, yeah. That there's a very small group of people that have extreme, enormous amount of power and have used their power to fund climate denial, to fund doubt, to block alternatives, and to run out the clock. And, uh, you know, and, and, and so she's saying, I don't really know what else I can do given that our political system is incapable of responding. And I think we're close to that moment, but I do say, think if more of us got involved with direct action and movements that were really sort of upping the ante. Um, and I, I should say, I, I anticipate in the next couple of years, given if business as usual just keeps continuing, we will see more militant, action in yeah. this space you know destruction of property uh, there's a very popular film out now called how to blow up a pipeline based on a nonfiction book of that name depicting people taking that action so uh i was i want to explore in fiction where where i think we probably are going i think i lost you i can't hear you though so sorry about oh, that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so as I was reading a book, and I, this is connected in certain ways, there were a number of times when I said to myself, I think this happened, or I think this is a person I've read about before, I've encountered in my own kind of research about various things. Mm. It seemed to me as I progressed that you made an effort to kind of incorporate real um, activists and real um, situations. That, and you've alluded to some of that already, but I was wondering if you could talk about that as a narrative strategy of bringing in, again, the example that came to mind in some ways, Forrest Gump, the, you know, that sort of um, character and movie from the 90s that was really popular and he encounters, he happens to find himself in some of the most important moments of sort of the late uh, 20th century, mid to late 20th century. 
And I had that feeling as I read your book as well. Was that kind of an inspiration? Or were you thinking in those terms as you wrote this book? Um, yes. Um, and actually, uh, Tim to Christopher, who's somebody I admire a great deal, uh, said, it's a, your main character is a cross between Forrest Gump and Diedrich Bonhoeffer. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was perfect because yeah, yeah, uh, like yeah. the Forrest Gump character or like Zelig, you know, they, they, they just happen to be Zellig, sort of yeah. bystanders or sort of connected to some interesting undercurrents. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are, there are real people in the story and I got their permission to oh. use their stories. I uh, particularly the main people there. One is actually a guy named Brian Wilson who uh, is not the Beach Boy singer, but uh, has that name, uh, Brian Wilson. He was a Vietnam vet. Uh, I actually knew him. He lived in Greenfield, Massachusetts. And he was the first person ever to tell me about Norman Morrison. He had his portrait on his wall. I said, who's this? Who's this? He says, that's Norman Morrison. He was this Quaker. And he told me the story, the true story, that when he went off to Vietnam, he knew about who Norman Morrison was. And he thought Norman Morrison is, you know, he, that was a really uh, a crazy thing to do, what he did. He didn't respect Norman Morrison's action. But in his years in Vietnam, he was obviously, he, he changed his mind about the war in Vietnam. He saw what the United States was doing. And in one part, that he the story that he told me is he he was walking through a village that had just been bombed by u.s aerial bombing yeah and there were no there were no living people there and all and most of the people had evacuated the village but he went into a hut and there was an altar and on the altar were candles that were still burning so people yeah. had just fled they'd left their altar burning and on the picture are were ancestors as you would often see in many altars around the world, but there was a picture of Norman Morrison. Mm. And Brian, this just like, you know, had this huge impact on him. Like, wow, these people in Vietnam are have Norman Morrison on their altar. And it completely, I think, wired him. And he went back and he actually showed up at Norman Morrison's mother's house. Anyway, I, I thought, well, that's an amazing story. Can I fictionalize that story? and bring it into this fictional uh, vessel, um, partly to kind of invite people to say, well, was that a true story? And was that person real? And did that really happen? And it turns out Brian Wilson was trying to block arm shipments to uh, El Salvador that were being used to fund, to arm the Contras against Nicaragua. He, he put his body on a train track and lost his legs. Again, this is true. But most people don't know that story. So yeah. I guess I I, I uh, was excited to kind of weave in a few real things and real people into the fiction with their permission um, to lift up those stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was hoping if we, could, we, if we could hear some of the book in your own voice, would you mind reading a section or two of your book just so we can get a sense of- Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, one of the threads through the book is the, is the, is altars. Um, I mentioned the altar in Vietnam. Ray also travels in Central America. And those of you who've, you know, know the Celtic Samhain tradition or Day of the Dead, you know, there are kind of allegorical, uh, rituals around the world to honor ancestors and to remember. And Latin America, People say presente, you know, you mentioned Oscar Romero, people say presente, you know, as long as we remember somebody, they are still with us. So the theme of altars is very, very uh, a thread through through the story. Um, but there's one point where for Ray, it really, um, it changes her life. Um, and so she, just to set the scene, she's a in a refugee camp. She's working in a refugee camp in El Salvador. It's during the civil war in the mid eighties. And um, there's a woman in this refugee camp who is a midwife. And uh, she's 
delivered, you know, they used to say she's delivered half the babies in San Vicente province in El Salvador, you know, she's a, a, a sage and experienced midwife. Even the, uh, the European doctors come into this refugee camp and when they have a breech birth or something complicated, they call on Chepa, the, the local midwife. Um, so, but uh, let me just read a little bit about uh, Ray's experience of, of, of an altar. Uh, one day, Chepa invites Ray to visit her family to see her altar. Amidst the chaos and buff bustle of life in the refugee camp, Chepa has created a sacred space on a shelf in the corner of a single room shared by six. On her altar are several burning candles, devotional statues, and dozens of photographs. Ray recognizes Archbishop Roscoe Romero, with few flowers anywhere in the camp, she has placed freshly fallen tree blossoms and leaves around her altar. Their fragrances blend with the smell of ash and other herbs. She points to a voter identification card of a young man. It's her, the only photo she has. This is my son Ramon, she says in Spanish. He was assassinated by the army. Ray says, oh God, I'm so sorry, squinting at the postage stamp photo. She says, and this is my husband, Raul, Chepa says, pointing to a blurry photo of a man holding a machete. He was also killed in the conflict, she tells Ray. With her voice steady and tears cl clouding her eyes, she introduces her, Ray, to her universe of loved ones, many whom have died and suffered in the Civil War. Mi altar es mi fuente, she says, letting the sentence hang in the air. My altar is my source. Ray understands her meaning. This altar is where Chepa can grieve, but it is also the source of her spirit to live and to accompany mothers bringing children into the world. She has endured massive loss, her loved ones, her home, yet Ray feels how Chepa pulls toward life. Um, and then after her experience working in El Salvador, she returns, she's, she, uh, she reflects back on this. She says, during Ray's two months in El Salvador, she begins to feel more viscerally each decision in her life, especially around consumption of things, food and energy, how she benefits from this international system of advantage. She begins a journal entry with a quote from Monsignor Oscar Romero, quote, aspire to have more, I'm sorry, aspire not to have more, but to be more. And Ray writes in her journal, each decision I make requires a certain mindfulness. I don't feel burdened by, by it. It is like a spiritual practice where I try and often fail each day. What I do know is I have to do more and consume less. What will I do in the US where, as Brian Wilson says, consumption is the national religion? Most days, Ray is filled with gratitude for her life that she has back in New England. She has a job to return to and abundant food and loved ones at home. Ray gently handles her blue US passport, thinking about all the privilege, privilege and power that goes with it. More important, Ray now has an inner knowledge that no matter how hard things might get, she can always build an altar with the photos she can salvage and draw strength from it. So that's just one of the places where altars appear over and over. Yeah, thank you so much for that reading. Um, another thing that struck me as I read your book and you kind of, uh, I guess, allude to it in the excerpts you just read is Ray's spiritual journey, right? And that's a critical piece of this. And it's not something, I mean, so many parts of the kind of progressive movement are secular for many other reasons, for many reasons, but other parts of it are, are deeply spiritual and religious. Um, and especially as we confront the possibility of, you know, sort of crisis um, of, you know, I don't want to get further than that, but you know the fact that that we're mm. facing all manner of challenges. A lot of people are 
digging into their own sense of spirituality or or that is guiding them. And obviously some of the major movements that we so admire and seek to emulate, like the civil rights movement, for example, have this spiritual core, a spiritual center. So I wanted to talk, I was hoping you could talk first about like race spiritual journey and how important that is for that character. Yeah, you know, I, um, I, uh, the, I actually, there's a, one of the sections of the book is called formation. Yeah. And in uh, having grown up in a traditional Christian kind of uh, denomination, the concept of Christian formation is really important. It's sort of like, it, it's sort of like, how do you try to model your life after the teachings of Jesus or G yeah. as Jesus as a role model? And um, and then the notion of discipleship. What does it mean to be faithful to that? And you know, I know that many of the people probably reading this book are kind of not connected to institutional religion and that and that might even be a turnoff but in K in Ray's case you know she was raised Roman Catholic she was shaped by that but she's sort of gone on to <clears throat> kind of draw all kinds of forces into her formation uh like her discussion of altars the altar becomes a source of her spiritual sus sustenance uh there's you know ants the notion of ancestors and people who have passed to the other side are still with us. That becomes part of her spirituality. Um, she is formed by movements, by social movements and ideas and lovers and people that she meets along the way. So formation in a broader sense is what I want to show, uh, including social movements, which often are not considered you know, part of how we form ourselves, but they certainly form most of, I think, my me and the colleagues that I work with at the Institute for Policy Studies. So, um, and then I think later discipleship. Well, what does it mean to put your values into action? And at the very end, um, at her, at a sort of many years later, kind of a memorial service, her her husband, Ray Reggie says, you know. Her, Ray believed that this life that we're living here, in this case, they live sort of in a community, kind of an eco village where they're trying to live simply and live in harmony with the earth. She says, this is what Ray would say discipleship looks like today. It is recognizing our oneness with nature. It's queer liberation. It's recognizing, you know, we all are connected. It's um a uh, preferential option for the poor is a christian principle it is welcoming the stranger there are climate refugees coming into her, her community and people being displaced so in his words ray is practicing her discipleship is modeled by how they how they live and and uh you know while she respects the institutional religious traditions she is trying to live them more radically to their essence than the wider culture. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that dimension of your book and of your work because I come to this work from a spiritual perspective. I grew up in church. My dad is the most religious person I know. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about the life of Jesus Christ. Um, and as, as a kind of figure of of social justice, right? As somebody who talked consistently about the poor, about the least of these, you know, about Sermon on the Mount was something that my, you know, my my dad talked about all the time. Hmm. Um, and and I think as I sort of do my own work, I'm that's the frame that I take into my work, even if I'm not religious in the way that my father was, even if I have profound disagreements on certain aspects of of religion and Christianity with my father and with the way that Christianity has spread. Um, I was thinking recently of the, have, had you heard about the Asbury revival, Chuck? This was a revival that happened in Kentucky, I think a couple months ago. And it was like a revival in the style of revivals that happened in this country in the early mm. 20th century and beyond actually when yeah. somebody, you know, something, uh, something would happen at some point corner of the country and people would hear about it and then people from all over the country would would gather. So this happened recently um, in Kentucky and 
the thing I was struck by was that a number of people who were at this revival are progressive. They're concerned about the environment. They're concerned about poverty and, <laughs> and inequality. They're concerned about the direction our world is going in. And, but they're, they've also been, in a way, they feel exiled from religious mm. traditions because of the teachings of some of our contemporary religious leaders. Um, all of which is to say, Chuck, that I sensed in your work a kind of, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna frame this as carefully as possible, a kind of sort of sense that we need in a way that there needs to be a spiritual dimension to this work, right? That it doesn't make sense to just think about facts and figures. It doesn't make sense to just think about sort of policy and policy implications, but that we're all human beings with a spiritual core, right? And that in, in many ways kind of drives the work and it doesn't have to be within a kind of institutional framework, but that, that sort of part of the job of, of doing this work and being effective at this work is acknowledging our spiritual core. Do I have that right or am I completely off? No, ab absolutely. I mean, I, I and I, I I share that both your formative experience and sort of the wrestling of how do we bring this, you know, into our our social movements and uh, um, you know, I think there there's that moment where uh, that I read that Ray is thinking about okay, I I need to do these things, I need to be a better disciple, I need to consume less, but I'm not the, the way she sort of says is I'm not going to. I'm not going to succeed entirely. I'm a, I'm in formation. I'm 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 unfolding, and um, it's part of my spiritual practice to get up every day and try to live respecting other humans, respecting the boundaries of the earth and and my relationship that I'm I'm part of nature. I'm I'm integrated. That sort of spiritual tradition of interconnectedness. I'm going to try to practice that every day. And, and Ray tries to do that. And then, which makes it all the more curious or troubling, this ultimate act that she takes. Like, what would it, you know, if somebody who's rooted in that spirituality in the end also adopts this notion that this is evil. Yeah. And I need to, she's influenced in, by Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pacifist and a, deeply religious person who who in the end said uh i should attempt to, to the, god is calling me to murder a tyrant you know that was his his understanding yeah so uh you know i think i think you're right and and i love in the ministry for the future the the kim mm -hmm. stanley robinson book there's a character who's always saying we need to create a new religion we're not you know yeah, we're, yeah we can do the the the, the uh, currency exchange and the cap and trade carbon stuff and we can do the you know regenerative agriculture but actually we need to kind of become something new we we need to kind of find or tap into something some ancient wisdom that we've lost yeah. from traditions throughout human life um and we need we need to find that so that we can <laughs> survive and flourish again yeah, I'm also thinking about um, Contact, the film that was inspired by Carl Sagan's work and the character of Palmer Joss, who's like a kind of spiritual figure. And he's, you know, I think in many ways, the kind of prototype for a new kind of spiritual figure, which is, I mean, he's not, he um, is somebody who speaks to our spiritual desires and our yearnings. They don't go away, even if, like, again, the institutions that we've carried with us in the 21st centuries are inadequate in so many ways, but uh, but they they also capture a kind of feeling and desire and hope that we need, right? I mean, so much of the work we do is premised on the idea that we have hope for the future. That is an intrinsically spiritual idea, right? It's not something that's grounded in, again, facts and figures. It's And it's what movements are about. Movements are like, here's a future that we would like to inhabit. It's going to be incredibly difficult to get there. What gets us over this difficult moment? Faith and hope. Faith again is a spiritual. It's a religious kind of uh, concept. You know, belief in something that doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to pivot to a few questions. We have a number of questions from folks who are watching our conversation now. So I'll start with a question from Ruth White. She says, "Ruth says, 
Uh, I was so struck by the number of Bonhoeffer quotes and the dialogue about nonviolence versus when violence is justified. Have you seen Ted Glick's review that compares your book to Ministry for the Future? How do you see yourself in this reflection on nonviolence? Um, yes, I, um, you know, as I sort of alluded to, I, I, th I think I have been, but my character, Ray, is very much shaped by Bonhoeffer. I, and I did see Ted's and appreciated Ted's review. And, uh, um, but um, yeah, this, I think of this as a, a book about wrestling with violence and nonviolence or with what Ray, and of course, Ray's at the end of her life. She, she discovers she's going to die. She has cancer and it's affecting her well-being. It's, a, it's her, she sort of feels like her body's been under assault by chemical companies and, you know, corporations that put profits before community health. And she kind of in a very Bonhoeffer way, begins to articulate, has an articulation of evil, which is not something that, you know, we may throw that word around, but for her, it was not a, a light uh, because she believes in in the flourishing of all life and, and supporting life. I mean, the book starts with her, you know, standing out on the road, helping salamanders cross the road during spawning season because she hates the idea that these salamanders are going to get and frogs are going to get run over her respect for life is so deep so then what you know so for her to wrestle with taking a life uh is completely outside of her understanding of what what she's called to do but it was through bonhoeffer that she wrestled with that and understood her discipleship is going to look different than other people's. Um, so yeah. yeah, if you if you like Diedrich Bonhoeffer, there's a uh, there's a lot of little interesting twists. For instance, the book actually is executed in Germany for trying to kill Hitler. So there's a lot of those little twists. Thank you for that, Chuck. Um, the next question is from Jane Banner. Why did you want the main character of this book to be female? Did you find this difficult? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think that uh, partly I have, Ray, Ray is, for me, she is a composite of many, many women that I know and know intimately and know as friends and know as longtime colleagues. So um, I did uh, ask a lot of female readers to help me out at different points and to give me feedback. And, and uh, there's, I have one, one, one friend who said, uh, well, this is sort of a, your concept of her, her final action, her violent act is a very male gendered notion. I said, well, let me introduce you to the 10 women who are who are have been who have been the ones who have been talking to me about taking dramatic action there. So um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's obviously challenging when you're writing outside your lived experience. But um, I felt like I felt comfortable enough in my lived experience with uh, the women in my life to to try to depict uh, a lead female character. Uh, she is there's also uh her partner reggie who i i felt more comfortable you know in some of my characterizations of him and and dialogue but yeah it's uh but i actually think you know uh i have read great writers who write outside their um their zone their their yeah. identity and so i don't think it's impossible uh and i think it's a worthwhile for us to put to get in other people's shoes and see how we do and, and stumble and fall. But uh, so anyway, I'm curious, Jane, when you read it, how, 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 if it rings true. Uh, one of, one of my heroines uh, is Starhawk who wrote one of the great utopian fiction books of my uh, youth called uh, fifth sacred thing. So I sent it to Starhawk and Starhawk wrote back and she said, she gave gave me the Starhawk blessing, so like, okay. So that mean that meant a lot to me as trying to wander into that space. 
Yeah. That's great. Um, it's I, I teach fiction, as you know, Chuck, uh, to students at Georgetown University, and I encourage them all the time to step outside of their comfort zone. I mean, for me, that's the act of, of fiction making. It's really an opportunity to inhabit personalities and ideas and, and sort of render ideas that maybe haven't necessarily occurred to you as a human being making your way through the world. Uh, and in my own work, I, I find it a delicious challenge to try to write, you know, sometimes out of my perspective. And um, I remember I had this bracing experience maybe six or seven years ago when I was working on a piece of fiction. Um, and I was the only uh, sort of man in this uh, workshop. The rest were women. And I was working on a female character and, you know, they'd read my work before and they they tore into me, you know, they were like, <laughs> no, this doesn't happen. But that experience was so important for me because one, it provided me insight that I was missing, you know, a perspective that I lacked. Hmm. And and it forced me to be more rigorous in my construction of characters that, that aren't me um, and to kind of adjust my biases and my way of assuming other people think. So again, sort of subjecting yourself to the rigor of that process, I think is incredibly important. Um, the next question is from somebody named John Cavana. I don't know who that knows, to former director of the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, his question, he has two questions. His first is, can you talk a bit about the groups that inspire you today that are confronting the climate emergency? And what is your favorite book on climate that you would recommend either fiction or nonfiction? Well, I do think the 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 groups that are trying to figure out sort of the red, the, you know, what does action look like? What's the appropriate response? So within the climate space, uh, you know, um, this the Climate Justice Alliance that our colleague Basav is very, very much part of and helping uh, inform others. Um, the Extinction Rebellion is trying to figure out what what does it look like in terms of more bold and militant tactics. I really appreciate the work of the Post Carbon Institute because they've been consistently sort of helping think about how do we build community resilience, um, which is another part of the story. I think is, you know, what is what does it look like? What's and that's the future fiction part. What does what does it look like for a community to come together and prepare themselves? Um, and actually, um, I. On, on the website for the book, which is chuckcollinswrites.com, there's a link to taking action. There's a link to um, a whole bunch of groups. Um, my my a friend and, and author uh, buddy, Andrew Boyd, has written a terrific book called I Want a Better Catastrophe. Hmm. And together, he, we created a little lexicon of the different types of action that people may be called to he, he uh, Andrew calls it the 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 movement enneagram you know what's your are you interested in wisdom traditions are you interested in militant action are you interested in sort of grief work you know here's the like the whole menu depending on your gifts and temperament um so check out that you know chuck collins rights.com also better catastrophe.org you know has some of the some of those movements that we uh, are are pointing people to, um, as well as on that website, actually, I have a, information on the real historical figures and background in the book. So that you know, if people are interested, you know, I want to know about who is Brian Wilson and who are these uh, old yeah. black black war, war tax resistors, Wally and Winita Nelson. Who are they? Uh, there's sort of uh, links and signposts and uh, bibliographical information there. So. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the, um, I love, I, 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 I can't get enough of any, any sort of fiction that shows people being, using their agency. Yeah. Um, social movements make history and that's what we believe at IPS. Yeah. Let's look at the social movements that have shaped history up to this moment and what, think through what are the social movements that will help us fix the future. Um, that. That uh, is is exciting, and I and there, I I don't see enough. I'm curious if you see this, Tope. If you have a favorite fiction that sort of depicts people trying to do meaningful work, I was thinking about 
John, John Steinbeck in Dubious Battle, which is really about a, a labor organizer and the interior life of somebody who's trying to, who's a lifelong changer, making change. Uh, there's, there's not enough stories that I'm aware of. So I love people's ideas and recommendations for, for fiction in that space. But that was part of my intention in this book was to tell the yeah. story of movements. Yeah, it's a really good question. One that I've thought a lot of about. I mean, because there's this kind of ongoing conversation in the fiction world about whether, I mean, at this moment of crisis, whether artists are supposed to be, you know, sort of continuing to tell stories that the muse whispers into their ears, you know, which might be about whatever, or if there is an obligation to kind of write to the moment. Um, I was a few days ago watching a documentary about James Baldwin, and he, you know, sort of struggled with this during his life as well. I mean, he left the United States because of all the, the sort of racism he was dealing with. He, like many writers, went off to France, had a difficult time there, but also experienced a kind of artistic awakening, wrote his second novel, Giovanni's Room, when he, while he was there about um, two men engaged in a relationship. It's the kind of book that he probably wouldn't have been able to write in the States. Um, comes back because of the civil rights movement and is sort of doing what he can to kind of talk about, um, you know, sort of rights for people and and the importance of, of uh, moving beyond, you know, this sort of really difficult uh, sort of history with racism in this country. And all, all that's, wow, that's sort of inhibiting his work. He goes to Turkey and begins to write fiction again. And so... <clears throat> I think it's really difficult, you know, sometimes because I think from my vantage point, I might I might be wrong about this. I think the best fiction is the kind of idea that wakes you up in the middle of the night and you're like, okay, I need to write that. And sometimes, sometimes that is about, you know, um, movements or a crisis that we might be confronting, but oftentimes it's not. Um, and so that, that's a really important question. Is this a moment when artists ought to be collectively turning our attention towards these moments and consistently? Because a lot of, the work that does come from an explicitly kind of like either, um, you know, sort of instructive place sometimes isn't as compelling as art, right? So it's a really difficult question to confront. I'm wondering if you have a perspective on that. No, I, I think um, I, I, I'm seeing the emergence of a lot of art in this in this wrestling with this moment that we're in. Yeah, uh, whether it's you know, racism or the state of democracy or the ecological crisis and i it's on schedule to me it's like very exciting i totally respect people who who, who don't wake up in the night and think think about those themes and write yeah. about other issues of our interior lives and yeah. family and friendship and connect you know other challenges um but i am a sponge for anybody who's trying to sort of make sense of the the impossible news of yeah. the ecological moment we're in yeah um, and offerings and even in the questions i see and chat i see people suggesting books and films which i uh I, I i look forward to following up on the ones i don't know about yeah yeah um it's something i've struggled with in my own work whether now is the moment to begin to think right explicitly about our the challenges we're facing and uh the kinds of things that I've experienced in my own life that speak to enduring issues around race and inequality and the rest of it, or whether it's a kind of right, you know, again, what does the moment require and, and, and what should I be producing as an artist at this point? I think it's a question that a lot of artists are grappling with. And um, I'm not sure there's one answer, but yeah. I think as, you know, the world gets more complicated that I, I suspect more of us will begin to write in the direction of trying to provide hope or show conversely show the negative things that might happen if you don't change course um i'm trying my best there's so many questions which is a great sign for you chuck people are are excited about the work and about some of the stuff you've been saying i want to move to a question from justin smith justin said hey chuck i wanted to ask if the first if the movie first reformed which has themes of uh, weighing the costs and benefits of violent action was on your mind at all when dropping the book? I only learned about and watched First Reformed after I'd written the book, which is 
which is probably good, uh, you know, whenever you're writing and it, people will give you, tell you, oh, have you seen this? Have you done that? Sometimes you want to kind of, kind of do your own work and then read that. But um, the reality is, I, you know, like for instance, this film, How to Blow Up a Pipeline just came out. It is a, a really good dramatic film with really deep backstories of the eight individuals who are part of it. I, I recommend it as a dramatic story, as well as a sort of reflection on the moment we're in. Um, so yeah, I, I, I loved the first reform. I thought it was really, uh, inspire, interesting, you know, in that, uh, and, and, and in a way less didactic, I, I don't think of my book as being prescriptive or didactic, but it was yeah. even more, I think on a deep, you know, worked on a deeper level than, than what I was able to do. But, um, so. Yeah, that's been on my to watch list for a very long time. So this is a reminder that I need to watch it as soon as possible. I've heard great things about that movie and I love movies in general. Uh, so I'll watch that as soon as possible. Um, Ruth White, another question I believe uh, says, I am reading the undertow scenes from a slow civil war by Jeff Charlotte, Charlotte. And I'm struck by his depiction of Trumpites is filled with a similar despair, anger, distrust that the system in quotes will support them Hopelessness that politics can ever make things right and say F it and turn to conspiracy theories and find meaning and even joy in being angry and opposing all that many of us consider normative. So they rebel by being anti. What strikes me is the level of frustration and despair about the current system ever working that shows up on both the right and left. Of course, in their despair, they want to believe that Trump is a savior. This is similar, in my mind, to blowing things up. What a what a thoughtful, interesting comment. Um, I don't know if I'm frozen or you're frozen, Chuck. That feeling that okay, um, <laughs> you froze for a moment, Chuck. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's a uh, Elon Musk is trying to interfere with our discussion through Starlink. <laughs> he's, he's, um, he's, he's like. He's like, I've had Stop enough. Now. We're gonna Tope and Chuck, we are done with you. Um, so if I get cut off, you'll know what happened. But um I was just thanking Ruth because I think that that was a very uh insightful thing because I think that similar feeling of powerlessness and then the desire to sort of act out of that powerlessness, because I have no I don't see any alternative. I could say, and I bet a lot of people who've look to Donald Trump who could say our political system is currently incapable of addressing the critical challenges facing our society. Be but I would go on and say it's very systemic and we can point to the fossil fuel industry, how they have captured our political system, how they've kind of used their wealth and power considerable wealth and power to block alternatives so you know even if you you know and it even if you wanted to live a less carbon intensive lifestyle it would be very very hard because for four politicians conservative politicians whose job is simply to stop progress uh, funding politicians to stop progress. So here we are. That's the impasse we're in. And I would say it's because of corporate power and corporate domination of our political system. It's working perfectly. The fact that we can't fix anything, that we can't help working people have a decent life and have access to health care, we can't fix the climate crisis, is because these corporations have occupied our democracy. Um, so that's where I would say there's a different analysis and a different prescriptive coming out of it. Um, but I feel, I imagine the feeling of powerlessness and anger and wanting to strike out is is a similar impulse. Yeah, I thought it was a really insightful, it, it is a really insightful comment as well. Um, and I, I need to read the book, um, but I hadn't thought of it in precisely those terms before that, um, you know, the, this kind of desire to follow Trump is, analogous to a desire to just blow stuff up and you know and people have said it in certain ways but I hadn't thought about it quite like that before so I think it's a reminder that you know part of our work Chuck is to 
do as good a job as we can in reaching out to folks and, and showing um, both the constraints of the current system and why those constraints are in place and you know possibilities for renewal as well. I think that's a major responsibility for us. Um, Nate Smith has a question. Nate says, Chuck, it's Nate. Hi, your book is especially prescient with the reports this week that we're going to hit 1.5 degrees within five years. Do you believe we will not see an increase in drastic acts like raise, but actual governmental and industry action? What hopes do you see on those fronts? Um, P.S. Come see Chuck's in-person events coming up in the region. Nate is <laughs> obviously a supporter. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Nate. Um, yeah, you know, I th I think um, Nate is somebody I is very involved with Extinction Rebellion and is you know gets arrested doing righteous acts of climate justice. So I appreciate that question, and I do think I, I kind of alluded to this, but I think given it the wall the 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 brick wall around if you if you say you know can the U.S. Congress do anything meaningful to address the climate crisis? Certainly not in its current form. That doesn't mean there are other are not other avenues um, for action. And we have this, unfortunately, you know, the fossil fuel lobby, uh, as as my character Ray says, as we sit here, they are betting that we are not going to get our act together to stop them. Mm -hmm. So they're continuing to build fossil fuel infrastructure. They're continuing to um, um, uh, invest billions of dollars in extracting and burning billions of more tons of carbon and other and methane. So they're they're they if if you're sitting there in the fossil fuel industry, you're you're looking at a clear runway, an unimpeded runway. Except there are now people putting their bodies in the line trying to stop new fossil fuel infrastructure. There are local jurisdictions and states and other countries that are saying no new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, there's the divestment movement, which is withdrawing capital and stigmatizing investing in this. Um, so I think I think we're just gonna, we have to have kind of a, a stepping up of all kinds of tactics in relation to the climate crisis and the, the, the intersecting crisis, democracy, yeah, economic inequality, they're all this sort of the same system drivers. So, you know, I think uh, I think we will see uh, and we want to encourage people to ask themselves, what does bold action look like in in um, in my future fiction? One of the things that actually shifts after Ray's action is a number, a, a group called a group of grandmothers calling themselves the good ancestors emulate themselves in the lobby of ExxonMobil all of a sudden and they issue a powerful statement around this witness and it does shift focus to people start asking why would they do this and what was the role of the fossil fuel industry and a divinity school convenes us a, a, a seminar called is this a Bonhoeffer moment in the climate crisis so all of a sudden there's a sort of not a call for, uh, you know, uh, assassinations, but a call to laser focus in on the responsibility of this industry and how do we change that. And, and if we succeed, these fossil fuel carbon barons will be considered like narco traffickers. They're, they're, they're like drug cartels. They're, we should criminalize the behavior. We should seize assets. We should prevent them from burning additional assets, we should separate oil and politics, you know, so that the funding stream from big carbon and big methane can no longer influence our political system. That's the consciousness shift. So I actually, I, th I think that's going to happen in the next two years. That's you why. Do. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think that's, that's, there's, there's business as usual status quo. But as I try to depicted my novel over the next seven years we 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 begin to make the turn yeah can I ask why you you have that hope 
Well, the alternative isn't so great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I actually see the seeds of those movements all all around us, um, and and including the sort of place based community resilience work. You know, people. Uh, I live in a part of the country where there's a whole regenerative agriculture movement that looks not only about how do you create a local regional food system, but how do you draw down carbon emissions. Um, recognition of the science, recognition of, you know, the work that Basav and others do on, on transit, transit equity. Like they're all, so my, my vision is just bringing to scale the thing, the things that I already see in process led by uh, people all over this world. Yeah. Can I ask you what your hope for this book in the world is? What is your hope for this book? What do you want it to do? Well, I'm I'm just thrilled with this conversation. This is, you know, all you can really hope for with a book. You can hope people read it, which mm -hmm. fewer and fewer people read books. But uh, we'll have the audio book is being recorded this week. Oh, so for people who are not book people, they can listen to it uh, hopefully in a in a week or two. Um, but the hope is to have a discussion. You know yeah. that it that it sparks something that sparks revulsion. You know, I think it's a I've tried to be provocative in a way that. We'll get people to say, "Well, that's that's an awful idea." So then, my invitation is, "Well, what's what's your idea to respond at scale to the crisis that we're facing?" Um, there are other threads in the book, in addition to those sort of themes around violence and nonviolence. For instance, I try to uh, foreshadow a very different culture around death and dying, where people start to celebrate that they, they, we demedicalize dying. We do what Stephen Jenkins talks about. Jenkinson talks about dying wise. We we sort of understand how Anglo American cultures around death phobia are very much of a limitation to what we need to understand to face the future and uh, and live full lives. So I also try to depict people trying to create a different culture around death and conscious dying. And even having what uh, one character in the book calls living shivas, celebrations of life while somebody's still with us, but they're at the end, and maybe they're going to choose to go out with assisted, uh, with an assisted death, a good death. And but before they do that, they want to have a celebration. So there's there's also some depiction of a new culture around death and dying, and around building, you know, meaningful community resilience. Um, a lot of science fiction books have a lot of cool technological gizmos yeah. <clears throat> and uh, AI and all this stuff that we are spending a lot of time thinking about. But because it's my book, there's <laughs> hardly a cell phone in it. Yeah. There's no techno future savior. The technology is what we already have, which is how to, how to live in harmony with the earth and with one another and steward and play our appropriate role as gardeners and tenders and grow the food we need and live in harmony with one another. So, uh, and that's an honor to, I, I live with four people in their twenties who are totally analog. Like <laughs> if I were to text them right now, I wouldn't hear from them for days, and even though they're, <laughs> they're standing over a hundred yards from me. They're, they're my inspiration. And they, yeah, they're, they're rejected certain aspects of the sort of hyper technicalization and and social media and all that stuff. They're like, that's that's not how we're going to live. So that's another thing that I depict in this book. Uh, uh, imagine a, a a novel without any cell phones. Yeah, it's heartening, especially as I I have two small kids here and and am thinking constantly about how to um, and they're already feeling the pressure to kind of and it's funny my six year old in particular she asked me a couple of days ago uh, when can I have a phone I was like uh, no. <laughs> Um, but it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. She sees us, you know, us being her mother and me on phones constantly for work, for socializing, for the rest of it. And so um, we're kind of creating a kind of, you know, do as we say, not as we do scenario with her, which we're very cognizant of. But um, we know as well that that she's not ready, no, nor is any child ready to kind of be ushered into this like fantastically strange and chaotic world of life on the internet and social media and the rest of it. I'm glad you brought up the piece in your book, uh, uh, the kind of conversation about 
death and dying. Um, and I wanted to ask you, like, it seems to me that you're advancing a really intriguing worldview in this book, a book that is, you know, sort of, again, we talked about the spirituality piece of it as one component of it. The other part of it, of course, being an awareness of this um, crisis situation that we are in and the fact that we need to do something, we need to change in all kinds of ways, in a radical way in order to confront this challenge. And then, of course, there's the kind of what I would describe as a more mature understanding of and and con and sort of a, a more a more mature way of thinking about death in a way um are these and, and the death piece in particular how is that related to some of the stuff that we've talked about another way of i guess asking this question is um is our kind of really strange and odd and even adversarial relationship with death in some ways connected to our inability to kind of take action on some of the pressing challenges that we've described before. Is there any connection between those two things? I, I think you said it maybe better than I characterized it. I think, I think, you know, Ray Kelleher, my character would say, our, our kind of the, the cultural norms in this, they're her subculture at least, are keeping them from being able to think, think through, you know, thinking through a good death, thinking through what dying and living well means, thinking about our kind of interconnection to nature and what does it mean to, to die and what happens after we die. All those are things that keep us from facing the future, our sort of death phobia, you know, the, the, the tremendous denial of what we're going through is partly of our, our death phobia and denial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she would say, uh, and, and actually one of my favorite quotes in the book, uh, Omar Torrio says, you know, uh, the, the, you know, he, he's the president of Panama and he's, he's taking Graham Greene around to these different villages. And he says, you can tell how, whether the village takes care of each other by whether they take care of the cemetery, mm. meaning that yeah. how people honor the ancestors tells us a lot about how they live today. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, we, we have a lot to learn from Lot wisdom traditions around that that are out there that, that are there to be learned from um that uh will help us in this process of facing the future yeah yeah well said the great basav sen who runs our climate program at ips has a question for you chuck basav says to what extent do you attribute the fossil fuels industries stranglehold on our political system to the imperatives of u.s empire in your view, is the evident consensus of our ruling elites, corporate, government, et cetera, in support of fossil fuels symbiotically related to the elite consensus and the support of U.S. world domination? Well, uh, you know, this is the beauty of working with the, at the Institute for Policy Studies, where we, 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 we pull on one thread and we see the sort of systemic interconnections. Yeah. Uh, so in a way, uh, by way of self-criticism, the, the, the sort of narrow focus on a couple dozen fossil fuel companies and their role in pushing a particular agenda sort of sort of lets off the hook all the other uh, the other Fortune 500, if you will, or the other entangled uh, uh, powerful entities that dominate the military industrial complex that also have captured our political system, uh, that have also captured um, you know the, the the systems of domination that that come through our political system. Um, one thing that uh, I like in my book, uh, there's a chapter about the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC. You know, which is yeah. this uh, re regulatory agency that oversees pipelines. Most people have never heard of FERC. No, most people have never heard of the the captured governance agencies that have limited our options and have their way with our elected political system figures. So uh, part of part of my little micro witness was to tell a story that also involved them dealing with this agency and what Ray describes as the authoritarian fist of U.S. energy policy, which she personally experiences being thrown out of a meeting, you know, physically thrown out of a meeting. So, um, so anyway, thank, thanks, thanks to Basav and the work of the Climate Justice Alliance, which he's one of our connections to and leaders with, of 
looking at the whole web of systems uh, that we, and to have that understanding is so important as we diagnose the problems and, and prescribe action. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. John Havana has another question. Uh, he says, you write about several vital social movements that shaped you and Ray, anti-nuclear, anti-Vietnam War, Central America, slow food, et cetera. Which of these movements do you think activists of today should read more about to help give inspiration to the movements of today? You know, I think I think we we can learn from both for, from movements that take that long haul perspective, and then what does victory look like along the way? Yeah. Um, at one point, Ray has a formative experience, which is she learns from uh, a very uh, important nonviolent trainer named Bill Moyer, not not the TV Bill Moyer, but Bill Moyers who writes about the stages that social movements go through, the formation stage, the, the pre preparation stage is what he calls it. You know, it's, and that's the point at which you're, you're doing things and you're sort of asking yourself, is this going to really matter? And then something happens. There's a trigger event or a tripping, a tipping point. Yeah. And then there's an acceleration and a sort of sense. And, you know, you can look at almost all the social movements of the last century and sort of nothing's linear. It's probably very, you know, things go through stages or cycles. But to understand sometimes the importance of preparation, you know, yeah. and at the Institute for Policy Studies, we're always trying to seed the ideas that are not sort of that are like two steps forward for into the future. And once something gets adopted and embraced, we kind of keep moving forward, moving on, you know, and and so I think the role of um, ideas into action, of seeding, uh, organizing and education work before people are in the streets. Everybody thinks movements are people in the streets, something happening, but there's all this work that goes into getting to that moment. And there's all this work that goes into after it, to consolidating those gains and institutionalizing them. And, you know, we need to, so I would say almost, you know, the history of the civil rights movement. Uh, I found the anti-nuclear power movement interesting because there were people fighting, you know, kind of tilting at windmills and uh, nobody was listening to them. And then, boom, there was an accident. And all of a sudden, the fact that that movement was in place made a huge difference. Yeah. So sometimes we're putting yeah. putting things in place for the moment when that we can't necessarily anticipate. We do know that they're going to be continuing ecological crises, uh, weirding weather and disruptions and floods and fights, fires, and, you know, the climate crisis, as it gets more acute, more people are going to be, it's going to be harder to deny anthropogenic climate change. And people are going to ask, what can we do and who is responsible? And I think seeding that understanding that how we got to this place is, is absolutely key. Uh, and the sort of history of colonialism and the patterns that got us to this moment. So um, there's no one single movement. I think, you know, again, where, wherever you're drawn, whatever, yeah. wherever your own liberation draws you, is there are probably histories of movements that can help inform what you're, what what we need to do. I love your point about uh, the kind of anti-nuclear movement and the fact that there was a kind of infrastructure in place, and then the tragedy occurs. And then there are people who have done the organizing work and who are ready to kind of go out and say, here's what we have to do. There are people who have done the intellectual work that provide the kind of intellectual underpinning for, you know, this kind of new direction. Um, and it's a reminder that, you know, you do that work even when, you know, again, it's I, I'm returning in a way to the, the concept of, of faith and preparation, um, even when there is no, you know, sort of funding or sort of consensus that this is something that's necessary. You, you do the work anyway, because you know what where the trends are leading. You know where our world will likely end up. And you say, we're doing this work. And when the world, as it were, is ready to kind of engage in a conversation, we have tools at hand to help us kind of navigate this new uh, space. And I think it's a really important point. Um, we're running low on time. We have about five minutes left. 
So I'll ask you another question that has occurred to me during the course of our conversation, which is, you might be surprised to hear this, Chuck, but a number of people, uh, you know, approach me, they email me, they talk to me and they say, hey, you know, they kind of whisper, they always whisper, you know, like, hey, I do this thing, but I'm interested in writing a novel. And, you know, do you have any tips or ideas? And so you've done that work. I wonder if you have any kind of tips for people out there who are thinking they have an idea or they're struggling with something. You actually have sat down and written this, this great book. What's your advice for people who want to take the leap and do what you've done? I think it is useful to write without being attached to the idea that it'll be published. I mean, I think that's a yeah. challenge because sometimes you're like, well, why am I doing this? No one, but I do think to, to <clears throat> just enjoy it, you know, enjoy the process, make the space to, and, and engage it in as a practice, a spiritual practice, or just a regular practice, like exercising or something. You just get up and, and take that hour, half hour, even, um, I mean, I'd actually be interested in, in your, I think you get asked that question. I don't uh, more than I do. So I'd be curious to hear mm -hmm. your, your, your counsel as well, but yeah. Um, right. And, uh, and then, you know, find, find places and other people who, who are kind of <laughs> on that journey and, and, uh, and build, build community together, not, not just do it as an isolated process. Yeah. I think you said it perfectly. I mean, that's the advice. That's precisely the advice I give people in my case. Um, you know, I tried for years to avoid writing. You know, my parents had told me this is no, stop it. You know, go do something <laughs> that will get you money and security and provide for your uh, enable you to provide for your family. Um, and there was a moment, I don't know if I've told you the story before, Chuck, but I was working at my first job out of grad school. I was on a plane to Istanbul, um, where I did a lot of work and um, I was, and I just had been struck by this idea. So I spent my, the entire time on the plane, like writing this piece of fiction that occurred to me overnight. Um, and as the plane was landing in Istanbul, I was sitting next to a Turkish businessman. We had exchanged pleasantries at the beginning of the flight. And at the end, he said, whatever you were doing, whatever you were writing for the entirety of the flight, that's what you need to spend your life doing. And that was the moment when I said to myself, Wow. I mean, it, for me, again, we return to the theme of like, you know, spirituality, I suppose, because at that point I said, he's right. It was an external validation of something mm -hmm. I had known internally for quite some time and it had been trying to push aside. And so at that point, a few weeks later, I quit my job. I moved back to the U.S. and I started to think about how I could create a life for myself where I was doing policy work and also doing art as well. So um, all of which is to say that if you can't shake it, I mean, if you have this desire to write or to create art or something, you can't shake it. It is with you all the time. You're constantly thinking about it then. I mean, to your point, do it regardless of whether there's the possibility for publication or acclaim or recognition. It's something, it's about you expressing yourself as a human being. Um, I, I think that's, that's just good. critical, yeah. Well, we're thankful to that guardian angel on that. <laughs> <airplane>. <laughs> exactly. And to all the guardian angels watching over those of you who are trying to think about creating. Yes, please yeah. create. We need <laughs> you to create. Um, I, so we're at the end of the conversation, Chuck. Before we end, I just wanted to encourage everyone who is on the call, uh, if you can, to sign up for the IPS newsletter. Uh, you can do that by going to ips-dc.org slash join. We would appreciate that a great deal. Uh, we have a number of wonderful newsletters and um, information that we put out every week about all kinds of things and information that I think reflects many of the topics that we've discussed during this conversation. Chuck, it's been such a pleasure talking with you about yeah. your marvelous book. Congratulations to you on doing this. I'm so happy for you. Uh, and I can't wait to see what this book does in the world. Thank you. Thanks so much for the it's just a fantastic conversation. And thanks for all the people tuning in. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you soon.